All right. Um, yeah, hello from our side as well. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Philip Kapus, and I'm here with my colleague Paul Gross. Uh, we are from the Lake of Constance in, uh, in Germany, <clears throat> and we like to present to you our paper finding clusters of similar minded people on Twitter regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we wrote this during our bachelor's studies, uh, which we now finished, and we're now looking for, for a, a good place to start our master's degree. And I will now hand over to Paul to present uh, our motivation. So sorry, um, I had to unmute myself. Um, so sorry for this short interruption. Um, our motivation was, of course, COVID-19, the pandemic influenced everybody's life. And for us, for example, this had to, uh, that we had to move our lectures to online uh, lessons and everybody has his own way of coping and our idea was to do some data analysis. So also for future motivation, of course, um, the COVID-19 regulations polarized many countries. And a part of this discussion is taking a pl uh, place on Twitter. And so we asked ourselves, is it possible to group users by their mindset regarding to those regulations? <clears throat> and today we want to present two approaches, one language-based and one network-based approach. All right, let's start on uh, how we uh, got our data set. Um, we made use of the Twitter's filtered stream API. Um, this is basically Twitter's way of providing uh, tweets to, uh, yeah, to institutes that are um, making scientific research, etc. cetera. Um, you, can, you can pull tweets that are posted in real time and that uh, obey certain filters that you can set. And our filters where uh, the tweet has to be in German language and it has to contain the keywords COVID and Corona and therefore also COVID-19, et cetera. <clears throat> um, we automated the whole process using Amazon Web Services where a EC2 instance actually registered uh, on, the, on the stream API, um, got every, continually got the, the tweets that have been posted and then stored it in a S3 bucket over a, AWS. Firehose. With this method, we collected nearly 3 million tweets in March 2020, one uh, posted by uh, around 260,000 users. Um, I will just quickly go over what a, a, a chase and tweet object that we get from, from Twitter looks like. So there's uh, basic information about the tweet, uh, when was it posted, which hashtags did it use, and what was the raw text. Also information about uh, the user, namely its user ID and, and, and the username. And also an interesting part is if this tweet is a retweet, meaning uh, there's an original tweet that this tweet is a repost of, then the original tweet object is contained in the retweet object. So you actually have information about uh, from which this uh, tweet is retweeted, um, also together with information about from which user uh, did it retweet? Exactly. We will now start with the search approach, and this is again Paul's part. Thank you, Philip. So for the language clustering, um, so sorry. Um, our key idea was that people who discuss similar topics will also um, use similar words. words. And we've got a few problems there um, um, realizing this idea. For example, um, we had to find a measuring for the similarity of two texts, and therefore we have to find a mathematical representation of a text. So our goal was to vectorize the set of texts, the set of tweets. And our first step, therefore, was to split every text into a set of words. For example, the sentence one marks like apples, we took a set with just um, each word separated. And then we go, went over all those tweets we got and unit that word sets. So we got one big set containing all words of, of the whole data set one time. 
So now we could compare our previous work sets with the whole with the set of the whole data set. And by looking which word is um, inside the set or which not, we could do a little, um, we could, we, um, could create a vector. And with those vectors, it is easy to calculate the distance between those two. And therefore, there are two main options. For example, the Euclidean distance and the cosine similarity. And to find out which will work best for us, we did a little comparison. Um, in this case, we used for newsletter articles, um, the first uh, three about climate change and one about the Middle East conflict. And our goal was to search for a method that outputs a high similarity between texts on the same topic and outputs a small similarity for text with, the, with a different topic. So we've to, um, made two tables just using uh, in the first table, the cosine similarity and in the second, the, the, the Euclidean distance. And as you can see, the colors are um, according to uh, the similarity, green means a high similarity, red means a low similarity, and the cosine similarity gives a way better result. So we choose that. Also, we had to prepare the text for the similarity analysis. As um, with text, you've got a problem that um, the semantic value of a word depends highly um, on whether it's a subject or whether it's an article or conjunction, and those had to filter it out. So the first step was to remove stop words. Um, and stop words are words like a and but how or what will. And as we used it on German language, we had to find a German stop word list that we find on GitHub. And we just used it and looped over it and removed all words from the tweets that were within those lists. Um, then we also um, made text limitization. This, there's the problem that if you, um, you've got two sentences, Anna likes apples or Tom and Mark like apples, likes and like are not the same, but have the same semantic value. And the solution to this is also um, is text limitization. So it's the reduced inflectional forms or durational related forms of a word to a common base. And most common example is to be, it could be I am, you are, he is, but you just want to have be or also plural um, changes. So also um, the word quantity was a problem. For example, um, if you got she likes apples and she likes tomatoes, you only got she and likes once in the set, as the set can't um, uh, contain an, an element twice. And our solution, therefore, and also an, a good way to filtering out many of the words as you get a huge data set, is um, to just to define a minimum quantity, for example, in this case, two, and then therefore just use those two. And here's a little um, progress view of all those um, preparation steps. And from the left to right, you can see that the results are getting better and better. And therefore, um, those um, text preparations were successful. So now that we've got a similarity matrix, we can um, try to cluster those using the similarity method. And there are also two problems. For example, um, one is that we've got many noise points, many tweets that are not really corresponding to one specific um, opinion and also the high dimension vectors as we got, for example, 14,000 different words. And um, those vectors have 40,000 different dimensions and those are very heavy to compute. And we did this um, by using a combination of k-means and db-scan. db-scan scan, um, mostly for filtering out noise points. And this is approach is also um, used in a case study of text mining. Um, you've got a source on the left by Gottfried Daniel. And basically, you create a consensus matrix, a uh, cross correlation matrix. And then you run multiple times of k means with different values for k. You can see those on the left hand side, run one, two, and three. And at the first, we um, took a k of three, then a four, and then a five. And then you look how often 
two elements get clustered together and each time you increase the value correspondingly in the consensus matrix. And then you will get a matrix which will say how often each element was clustered together with an upper element. So using that matrix um, and tweaking a little bit of the parameters, um, you can build out a graph using those consensus metrics and um, the, weights, the weights for the edges, and then just lay out the graph with a library. And the result of this process can be seen in the next image. We've got a um, quite um, a big, big image with many different points and the clusters um, correspond to the color. And you can already see hubs, but you can't really um, get a few into those clusters. And to get a little bit more meta information, um, we did a, a little um, subject determination. And therefore, we calculated the relative probability of a word across the whole data set, and also the relative, the relative probability of a word within a cluster. And then by calculating the relation of those two probabilities, we could determine how often a word was used more or less um, inside the cluster than on the entire data set. And then with this topic, we could also create little word clouds and scale the words accordingly. This will be shown in the next image. Um, and for example, on the down right um, image, you can see um, the word freiheit, which means freedom and um, lockdown, which should be known to everybody. And also AFD, so AFD is a German right-wing party. So you can see, okay, this green cluster down on the right um, will correspond to um, people close to the AFD. So you, we, could, we were able to cluster the people accordingly and also had a deeper look inside the clusters. So, and now I'll give over for, to Philip for network clustering. Right, thank you, Paul. <clears throat> Uh, I will now present the approach that we took uh, based on, on networks, uh, namely on retweets. Um, we can create a relation between two users uh, if one user retweeted the other. So we have one tweet object. We know this is from user one. And if it's a retweet, we know, okay, this uh, uh, the original owner of the tweet is user two. And therefore, we can create this relation between those two users. Um, building up a graph based on this has been done a lot, um, for example, by Stuart or by Conover. Um, but these graphs are getting uh, are really complex and, and, and are unfeasible to compu compute oftentimes and, and to investigate for, for clusters or for, for certain other attributes. Um, so uh, we came up with, with certain steps that allow to, to actually reduce the complexity of the graph but still keeping uh, important knowledge and important information that's uh, that's hidden in the in the data set. Um, so the first and major observation um, that we did was that actually nearly 32 uh, percent of all the retweets they are originally posted by the same 100 users. So we actually uh, can derive from this that those users. Are, are have a big impact on the opinion landscape on Twitter. Um, so those users, those 100 users, are, will, are we, we are calling influencers for now on. And, and we can actually then only regard uh, retweets to these 100 influencers. So we do not regard uh, uh, um, retweets of, from every user to every other user, but from every user to only those 100 influencers. Um, so this can be viewed on the image on the right. Uh, we can see three influencers in blue and all the users that are retweeting this influencer in black. So what we can see here, we have actually a lot of users that are only retweeting one influencer or maybe two influences between the upper two uh, blue influencers. Um, and since this is, this is a lot of, of, of computation power to actually display and compute every single dot, every single users, um, we can actually aggregate um, and represent 
all of the users that are uh, retweeting only one or maybe two or maybe three influencers into one so-called super user. So we say, okay, we know this user or this group of users retweets influencer one or, and influencer two. So we can actually combine, combine and aggregate those users and we present them with one super user. So this is a really important idea. Um, that, but this is, a, this is a big step in actually uh, reducing the complexity of this graph um, because instead of like 50,000, we can in this case only have uh, uh, four or five uh, super users um, in this graph. Um, we can then actually uh, calculate the possible number of, uh, of super users that are possible for a number of influencers. Um, by two to the times uh, uh, two, uh, two, oh, one minus one plus the uh, count of the influencer. Um, and we can, we can see, okay, if we use a set of 100 influencers, there are still more than 10 to the 30, uh, to the power of 30 uh, possible nodes in the graph. So this is still a lot, and this is still unfeasible to calculate. So what we do, we apply a threshold on a edge between a super user and an influencer um, so that we do not regard connections say, okay, if this super user only retweeted this influencer three times, this is uh, below this threshold. So we do not regard this connection as, as meaningful. Uh, a good estimate for uh, setting a good threshold is using 0.6% of the maximum weight in the graph. Um, so the next step actually is based on a discovery that we, uh, that we found when, when analyzing the uh, counts of retweets that each influencer has. Um, so we found out that the number of retweets um, of, of a influencer actually correlates well with an inverse power law. So this is depicted in the, uh, in the graph on this slide. We can see the um, actual retweet count of each influencer in blue. So, okay, uh, the uh, single most retweeted influencer uh, get, got retweeted nearly 40,000 times. Um, and this really correlates well with the inverse power law going down um, until the 100th in influencer. Um, and following the nature of such an inverse power law, we see, okay, there's a, there's a huge difference between uh, higher ranked influencers compared to lower ranked influencers. So this means uh, if we apply a threshold that on the one hand should reduce the complexity of the, of the whole graph, um, if we, it's, it's really hard to balance this um, when we also want to keep clusters that consists of more lower ranked influencers that just don't got retweeted this much, but, but they st still form a cluster. Um, and this is why we try to normalize the graph uh, by multiplying uh, the weight of, a of an edge to an influencer by the natural logarithm of the rank of this influencer. So this is how uh, we normalize the, the, the graph so that we can keep lower ranked influencers in the graph but still reduce complexity. So these steps applied to the whole data set from March, 2021 uh, yields this graph. Um, we can see here the influences again in blue and the super users uh, in black. So keep in mind, okay, a super user means uh, they're all users grouped together into one super users that retweet the influencers that are connected to this super user. Um, and we can already see, okay, we can identify clusters here. Like we as humans, we can clearly see, okay, there's one big cluster in the middle, right? Um, and, and certainly there's one uh, separate cluster, completely separated from the cluster in the upper right. And also we could identify a cluster that's on the bottom, loosely coupled to the, to the main cluster. So since we, we are doing computer science, we do not want a human to actually identify those clusters. So we've been using dbscan 
to identify those clusters in the graph. Um, just a quick reminder, dbscan uh, uses so-called core points um, that are connected to a minimum number of neighbors um, and then are clustered together in this way. A minimum neighbor in this case, or a neighbor in this case, for an influencer are all other influencers that are connected via super users. So in the example on the, on the right, we can see the circled in influencer is connected to four other influencers over the two super users. We did not use an epsilon because we are already a, applied a threshold, meaning uh, meaningless connections are already filtered out. Also, uh, we did a little tweak to the DB scan in order that we only regard new neighbors. So uh, to the minimal neighbor counts, there are, uh, the neighbors can only be ones that have not been visited yet. Um, and on the next graph, this will become clear why this is, uh, this is necessary. Applied to the graph that we have seen, uh, we can now clearly identify the clusters that, that exist on, on Twitter on March 2021. We've got the big cluster in yellow and we've got the separated cluster in red. And we can now see, okay, this is why it's important to only regard neighbors that haven't been visited yet so that we can identify the green cluster that is only loosely coupled to the uh, main clusters in green. So this is, the, this is the result from the network clustering approach. And, and at this point, I would like to take a little look into the, the clusters to actually see, okay, uh, do they correlate to a certain political opinion? Um, and this is certainly the case. If you look at cluster one, the main player uh, is Karl Lauterbach. This is actually the most retweeted person in the whole data set. Um, if we switch back, we can actually see him in the center of the main cluster. Um, he is a doctor and also a SPD politician um, who is uh, uh, really present in the, in the overall discussion on Corona. He's in a lot of talk shows, etc. Also, we have lots of public news agencies and private news agencies together with more uh, yeah, central, central or maybe left-leaning uh, Twitter uh, users. In cluster two, the second one that is loosely collected to the main cluster, um, we can already see a shift more to a more conservative and right wing position. For example, there's Max Otter as a, as a big influencer in this cluster. He's the former leader of the CDU Werte Union, which is a sub uh, subgroup in the CDU, focusing more on, on conservative values um, and, and, and is leaning a little bit more to the right. And your rockstar is uh, Annabel Schunkel. She's a journalist and she actually identifies her as, as more right wing. Then in the separated cluster, in cluster three, we have Laszlo Health and he is strongly against COVID regulations. Um, I'm, 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 I'm recommending you to actually look at, his, uh, look at those tweets and get a feel for yourself. Uh, we have also Henning Rosenbusch. He's a journalist, a free journalist who's advocating the Swedish way, basically saying, okay, we do not need any COVID regulations. Let's just uh, all get infected and, and then we will be immune as a society. Furthermore, and this is really interesting, uh, Thomas Binder, he's a former Swiss doctor, uh, and he got actually arrested and admitted to psychiatry because he refused to treat COVID-19 patients uh, as, a, as a doctor. Also, his account has been deleted, um, so we can only do analysis on the tweets that we saved for March. Um, after that, we actually tried to, to figure out, okay, can we actually identify a type of language that those clusters inhibit? And we did this by uh, comparing or by using the language class or parts of the language cluster in the approach by actually uh, applying the same steps on the clusters that we found in the network clustering approach. So we filtered out keywords uh, and we compared those and we displayed them in, in a world cloud that, can see, that, that we can see here. And I wanna point you to cluster three, the, the hashtags of cluster three, where they say, okay, uh, we will all be there. So this is, this is, a lot, this is used a lot in this cluster. Uh, there will be a great reset uh, we are not playing with you anymore and, and Merkel has to go. So this is really, we can really see, okay, there's a, there's a tendency in this cluster to, to, 
to lean really against COVID-19 regulations and even going into, into conspiracy theory. Um, so this is this is really interesting, and I think that these are great results that we can actually identify the, those uh, those clusters, and we can actually see uh, steps and and opinion and and language usage difference in those in those clusters. All right. Um, after that, we did a comparison, and I will hand over to Paul for for this part. Um, thank you, Philip. So I'll just um, do a little comparison. On the left hand side, you can see the yellow, the green, and the red um, clusters, and they were for the uh, network-based approach. And on the right hand side, you uh, saw, have seen in the image before, there were many more clusters, and it gets quite clearly that it doesn't match that well. And the key reasons for this is that we use different filtering steps for clustering um, on the current, um, on the network based and on the language based. So for the network clustering, um, we only consider users that retweet at all, and also only consider users that retweet influencers, and also applying a specific threshold to those uh, retweet counts. And on the language clustering, we can't focus on all the hashtags used in the whole data set, that will be millions, but we can only focus um, empirically on the 97 to 99.98 quantile um, of the hashtags count and only also only consider users that have used those specific hashtags more than six times and so it's um it will be a point for future work to um union those filtering steps to um, get more coherent results and on um we then, this we will already in our conclusion, um, we managed to analyze German COVID related tweets using um, one existing approach and also one novel approach. And with both approaches, we found that there are in fact groups of users that are using the same language and retweet only in their space or bubble. So there are also in the, uh, in the context of Corona the, and the filter bubbles everybody's talking about. So this is quite uh, cool to being able to visualize them. So of course, there's future work to do. Um, many uh, for, um, especially with the parameters of our algorithms for the network clustering the number of influences and the thresholds um, could be a few more adapted. And also with the language clustering, um, it would be very um, important to increase the iterations of k-means of the k-means algorithm, but that also means more computing power, which leads us on the next topic. Um, the as we can also optimize our process and use more sophisticated architectures. Um, at the moment, we were only running Python scripts on university PCs and our <laughs> on their local PCs, but um, with a cloud approach, you could compute more tweets, and it will also reduce noise points and um, result in better um, clustering results. And also, um, you could expand the analysis. For example, we could have a deeper look into the keyword analysis, and one re really interesting aspect would be also implement sentiment analysis, for um, example, with um, machine learning techniques are um, really good at analyzing uh, whether a user is positive or negative to, um, to a specific sentence. So this would also be a nice um, add-on. So um, that's what we wanted to present you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here at the Sunday. And if you have got any questions, feel free to ask. We also have put the tweets um, to um, a GitHub page so you can have a look at those and the, the graphs. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Thank you also from my side. Thanks.